today I'm going to comment on an interview between Richard Dawkins and Mehdi Hassan. Richard Dawkins is well known as uh, the latest prophet of a new religion. Well, it's not a new religion, but a religion called atheism. And Mahdi Hassan is a journalist for Al Jazeera. This dis uh, discussion took place in uh, a hall at Oxford University in front of many students there, Muslim and non-Muslim alike. In this context, the first verse of the Holy Quran that I want to recite to you is from chapter 3, verse 190. Those who remember Allah standing and sitting and lying on their sides and reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth. Our Lord, you have not created this in vain. Glory be to you. Save us from the chastisement of the Father. The other verse that I want to recite is from chapter 30 and it's verse 8. Do they not reflect within themselves. And Allah did not create the heavens and the earth and what is between them, but with truth and for an appointed term. And surely most of the people are deniers of the meeting with the Lord. Last verses that I want to recite to you are from chapter 45. near the beginning. The, revolution, the, the revelation of the book is from Allah the Mighty, the Wise. Surely in the heavens and the earth are signs for believers. And in your creation and in the animals he spreads abroad are signs for a people who are sure. And in the variation of the night and the day and in the sustenance which Allah sends down from the heavens then gives life thereby to the earth after its death and in the changing of the winds a sign for people who understand. I will skip, skip the next few verses and we'll go to verse 12. Allah is he who made subservient to you the sea that the ships may glide therein by his command and that you may seek of his grace. And he has made subservient to you whatever is in the heavens and whatsoever is in the earth, all for himself, or all from himself. Surely there are signs in this for a people who reflect. This is a chapter called The Kneeling. I have recited these verses to show two things. First of all, unlike other religions, God tells Muslims to look upon and study the earth and the heavens and the universe. Because if they do that, they will find therein evidence that there is a God. And the other reason I have recited these verses to you is that God says to human beings that I have made everything subservient to you. The first verse in uh, chapter, uh, I think, uh, 45 that I recited, not the first verse, uh, verse 12. gives an example of what was happening at the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad. 
and it says that if you put something heavy in water, it will sink. But I made that subservient to you so that you have huge ships full of men and goods and things you, the, the goods that you trade. But those huge ships, they defy that property of water and they sail from one place to another. And then the next verse, verse 13 then says, everything in this universe, whether it is on this earth or it is up in heavens, is subservient to human beings. But how will these things become sub subservient to us? It is by us studying those things, determining the laws that operate them and then using them. A similar example these days, of course, is of aeroplanes flying. If I were to let go of this copy of the Holy Quran that I'm holding in my hand, it will fall to the ground. And yet an aeroplane weighing many, many tons again with passengers and goods and luggage flies upon the air. There are aeroplanes that move faster than the speed of sound. We know of Concorde. So it's not just military planes, but this plane took passengers from one place to another faster than the speed of sound. And you must have heard of the saying in those days that people now have their breakfast in London and lunch in New York. But the thing God is saying is this, that all of these things, all this study, all the knowledge you acquire and gain, it should prove to you that God exists. You see, let us take an example. We had a car and every time, every week, we had to check the tire pressure. We had to open the bonnet. We had to check the water in the radiator. We had to check the level of uh, oil in the engine. Every year we had to take it to a workshop. There they would MOT, they'll check brake fluid and other things that we couldn't access to make sure everything was right. Now, cars developed. And now we have a car and I turn the engine on and it checks everything. And there are lights that come and on and off and on and off and it's checking the, uh, the water in the radiator and the engine level, uh, the oil, oil engine level and this and that and brake fluids and everything. And if there's something amiss, a red light comes on. In the example of the first car, when I wanted to go from A to B, I get uh, one of these maps and I look at where I am and I look at where I need to go many pages along and then I'll find a road and follow that and then start writing down how I will get from A to B. The car that I have now, I type in the postcode of where I am, I type in the postcode of where I want to go and I press enter and it tells me The next step is that is going to be that I'll get into the car and I'll type in this, the, the, those postcodes and the car will say thank you very much and start driving itself. 
And the next thing I'm sure is going to be that not only will the car automatically diagnose all, all its faults, but we'll also be able to correct them. It'll check all the faults, I'll get in, I'll turn the engine on, it'll check all the faults and it'll say, sorry mister, you can't go to Manchester today, I'm taking you to the workshop because the brake fluid level is low and it's unsafe to drive. And then we will have cars that will develop cars. But would it then mean, would it that mean that there was no creator of those cars? If you read science fiction stories by Isaac Asimov, there is a story that he wrote all about these cars and when they became old, just like these days horses are put out to a farm, these cars were being put out to these farms. And they had something called positronic brains and this and that and, uh, and so on. These cars that we are talking about and that we know about. My car now, when I reverse, you might have noticed that the back of my car these days is dent free. Because there's a little gadget that starts screaming, makes a horrendous noise and a red light comes on, saying you're very close to the car or the wall or the back or whatever it is uh, and stop. The point I'm trying to make is this. Does all of this mean if these cars become totally automatic, self-diagnosing, self-repairing, you just get in and say where you want to go, they'll automatically take you there, they'll go to the mechanic themselves and get themselves repaired. Would that mean there was never ever a creator of those cars? Of course not. You would say, don't be stupid. Initially someone made them and then they got developed. Now, what Richard Dawkins is telling us is this. There was nothing. There was nothing. And then there was a big bang. But how did that big bang happen? What matter, what mass, what whatever did that consist of to cause a Big Bang? You are saying it just happened. But someone, something must have caused it. What caused the Big Bang? You see, when a bomb explodes, it has something in it. Something causes it to explode. Now, Professor Dawkins argument is this. This Big Bang that we don't know why it was caused, this Big Bang that we don't know how it was caused, this Big Bang that we don't know who caused it, this Big Bang that we don't know what matter or material, whatever it was, consisted of at the time of the Bang. He is saying to us, believe me, that is true. But don't believe the fact that there is a supreme intelligence, a supreme being, a divine being who caused it to happen. Which is the more plausible explanation? That some supreme being caused it? If Big Bang is how the universe came about, remember, the theory of evolution is a theory. Einstein's theory is a theory. These are all theories. These are possible explanations for some things that we observe now. No one knows what happened billions of years ago to cause the Big Bang. This is guesswork. It is like, you know, finding a, a, a dead body somewhere 
and no one knows why this person dies and then going in and trying to explain what happened. Was it murder? Was it natural death? Was it an accident? What was it? There can be several and we, we see this in television programs. There are two possible explanations, one being put forward by the prosecution, one being put forward by the defence. And then they ask a judge and a jury and so on to pick which one they prefer. And the interesting thing is this, that it's harder for me, I think, to believe that all of this happened because Professor Dawkins says so, or Einstein says so, or someone else says so, than to believe that there is a supreme divine being who had a purpose in mind and who deliberately caused all of this creation to come into being. And the, the other interesting thing I want to put to you is this that Mahdi Hassan, at least on one occasion that I can remember, had to retreat into Ahmadi beliefs to be able to answer Professor Dawkins. Professor Dawkins said, now what kind of religion is Islam? It says penalty for apostasy is death. Do you believe that? Do you believe that a Muslim becomes a Jew or a Hindu or a Christian or whatever, his head should be cut off? And Mahdi Hassan immediately said, no, I don't believe that. And then he went on to say, there is a debate between Muslim scholars about what the penalty is. There is no debate. The whole of Sunni Islam believes punishment of apostasy is death. It is only it is only MDs who believe that this is incorrect. So I only can I can only conclude from this that Mahdi Hassan believes that these are that we are Muslims. But we are the only people debating and saying no, punishment of apostasy is not, not death because God says like Rafiddi. There is no compulsion in religion. Why? Because the right way is clear from the wrong way. So if someone goes, wants to go the wrong way, it's up to them. And this is why I say to you often that if Islam is to survive in this modern world, whether they accept us or not, they have to accept our interpretation of Islam. Sunni Islam believed all modern technology is work of the devil and un-Islamic and should not be used. And started with everything, photography, videos, glasses, microphones, loudspeakers. But now Sunni Malvis we with each other to appear on television. Well, that's a form of photography, isn't it? What do they put on their passports when they want to come over to UK or go over to United States and so on and so forth? The only organization that can answer Professor Dawkins is the Ahmadiyya movement. And why? If you read the Promised Messiah and Islam's book, Brahini Ahmadiyya, volumes 1 to 4, it is as if he's answering Professor Dawkins. And you can only prove in this day and age that there is a God by using the argument that Hazrat Sahib put forward. And that was that even today, if you call on God, he'll answer your call. There is no other way of proving that. And he said, in fact, he invited scientists to go to Qadian and sit with him and he will prove to them that God exists using their own scientific method. If a door is closed, there's no way to go in and, do, and go out, and you knock on the door, and you can't see 
what is in it and someone says yes, what do you conclude from that? Although I can't see what's in the room, although I don't know what is in the room, you will immediately, immediately come to the conclusion that there is someone there. Those who want a scientific explanation should go and read about Schrodinger's cat and how he used that analogy, a similar analogy to the one that I've given you to try and prove quantum mechanics or quantum theory. I think this is enough for today with a request for you to reflect upon the universe and this earth and the heavens and all that is in it because it will lead, 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 lead you to only one conclusion and that is that there is a God and he is a living God and if you call on him he will answer your call.